In his book, A Quest for Godliness, subtitled The Puritan Vision of the Christian Life, J.I. Packer reports that a Puritan preacher named Lawrence Chatterton, I think that should be spelt differently, but once apologized to his congregation for preaching for two hours. They responded, for God's sake, sir, go on, go on. Every preacher's dream. At 82, after preaching for 50 years, Chatterton decided to retire. He received letters from over 40 clergymen begging him not to, testifying that they owed their conversion to his ministry of the word. Packer states, Puritism was, above all else, a Bible movement. To the Puritan, the Bible was, in truth, the most precious possession that the earth affords. His deepest conviction was that reverence for God means reverence for Scripture. And serving God means obeying Scripture. To his mind, therefore, no greater insult could be offered to the Creator than to neglect his written word. I really think that God, God is overjoyed when your Bible is worn out. I had a friend back in Wasco, his name was Marty. Marty had to make sure he held his Bible upright because if he ever held it the other way, Romans would fall out because he had read Romans so many times and studied it over and over again. There was a time period when my daughter would come to me and she would say, Dad, look. And she literally had duct tape all the way around her Bible on every side. And I said, okay, your birthday's coming up. There's a new Bible going to be on the way. We should think of that Bible as being precious to us as well. Now, the one thing that I can tell you is good news. I will not be preaching today for two hours. Yeah, you can be happy about that, Alex. We must have God's word to grow in our salvation. It, it's sort of like, you know, if, if you think about it, you should be able to read God's word before you make that decision. You've got to be able to get into his word. You don't have to understand everything, but have a grasp on who Jesus is. So we think about it. Why would this sermon be entitled Feasting on God's Word? I'm not, I'm not going to cut up my Bible and, and eat the pages. And I don't know about you, but when I think about the word diet, I constantly think of die with a T. It's all, all it makes me think of is if, if, you go, if you go through certain parts of your life and, oh, you're not supposed to eat this, you're not supposed to eat... I'm going through one right now with my wife. Not by choice. But she's going on the keto diet for health reasons. And she goes, broccoli. Broccoli's good for you. I go, I know broccoli's good for me, but I really don't want to eat it. The only person who got me to eat broccoli was the lady who worked at our cafeteria in college. She covered it with cheese. And then it was, then it was edible. What is the word like? We could spend many messages here talking about the whole Bible. But we're going to limit ourselves to a couple of things. First of all, the word is pure. First Peter 2.2. 2. 
like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it they may grow up into salvation. The Greek word means literally, not deceitful. It is the same word, the Greek, it is the same word as in verse 1, translated guile, with the alpha added to the front, which negates the meaning. It means unadulterated, not watered down. Dishonest merchants in that day would add water to their milk to make it more profitable, make it last longer, be able to sell more of it. My son, and I know that he's sitting here today, I, I, may, have to, I may have to pay for lunch later because of this. Um, he doesn't like his words watered down. Matter of fact, he doesn't really like someone changing them. He has worked on those words. He has put them together in his own certain way. The Bible, if you take it straight, tells you the honest truth about yourself. It exposes the very thoughts and motives of your heart so that you have nowhere to hide. It is not uncommon, after I preach, to have someone come up to me and ask, did anyone tell you about what I went through this past week? Matter of fact, back in Wasco, there was a man named Danny Allen. And he came up to me one Sunday and he said, was my mother talking to you? Was it my brother who I work with? Was he talking to you? And, and I go, why? And he goes, your sermon. Your sermon was the, the hammer hitting the nail on the head. And I looked at him and I said, Danny, you know, you're only here about once every three or four weeks, and I can never count on which Sunday you're going to be here. So realize one thing. It wasn't me that decided this message was to go to you. It was God. It was the Father giving me this message to touch your heart. The word is rational. The literal translation of verse 2 is that we should go, we should long for the pure spiritual milk. The word spiritual also means rational. The only other time it occurs in the Bible is Romans 12.1, where Paul says that presenting our bodies as living sacrifices to God is our spiritual or rational service of worship. He means that it is the spiritual thing to do. If we don't do it, We've lost out. We're to be yielding ourselves to the will of God. I wish I could say, that's all you got to do. That's easy. It's not. It's not easy to yield yourself, especially in our day and age. How many other voices do you hear out there that say, I want you. I want you to worship me. I want you to do as I say. This term is purposefully ambiguous. Peter uses it to show us that he's not talking about the literal mother's milk, but rather about spiritual milk from the living and abiding word of God. This spiritual milk is rational. It is grasped by the mind. Thus, Christianity is essentially rational, but not rational in the worldly sense rational in the spiritual sense. Human reason must be subject to the written revelation of God that God has given of himself in the Bible. 
You cannot know God without using your mind. Since He has revealed Himself in the propositional revelation of the written Word. Dr. Packer says that per Puritans were educators of the mind. They believed that the mind must be instructed and enlightened before faith and obedience would become possible. While they deeply believed that God's truth must affect not only the head, but also the heart. They also regarded religious feeling and pious emotion without knowledge as worse than useless. Only when the truth was being felt was emotion in any way desirable. The word is to be nourishing. Peter is referring to a mother's milk as an analogy of newborn babes. He isn't contrasting the milk of God's word with meat as Paul does. We are always to be feeding on this nourishing milk. It is simple enough for the youngest infant in the faith but solid enough for the most mature saints. God has designed a mother's milk as the pure, perfect food for newborn babes. It will immunize her baby from any illnesses and nourish her baby for growth. God's word will protect Christians from the many spiritual diseases which abound and it will nourish them to grow in the Lord. A mother's milk will make her baby grow for months without any other food. God's word will nourish Christians so that they will grow toward salvation. Peter means salvation in its ultimate sense, which includes everything that God provides for us who are his children. We never reach a place in this life where we can stop growing. I don't know about you, but I'm at that place where when I get hungry, there's probably going to be some beef on the plate, which is, is, which is part of the problem I have with this keto diet. Maybe it's just because of my wife. She loves chicken. I'm one of those people that when you give me something else, I go, tastes like chicken. This tastes like chicken too. It, it, it just doesn't really have that much flavor. But I'm not looking forward to eating Gerber's anymore. You know, I want, I want solid food. I want a good steak. Something like that. So how do, we, how do we get motivated to drink in God's word? Peter says that we should be motivated as a newborn babe is for his mother's milk. I didn't understand this analogy until we had children of our own. Newborn babies have an intense craving for their mother's milk. It doesn't matter if it's 3 a.m. If they're hungry, they let you know about it. Now, I will say, my dog is also very good at letting me know about it. She will eat all the food out of her little container, and then she will take that empty container and throw it on the floor. So you can hear it on the other side of the room. She will let you know. She doesn't cry, but she does give you a look. I remember when Andrew came home from the hospital. We had to, we had to wake him up. He was so quiet for that first year, we almost forgot that he was there sometimes. The question is, how do I get that kind of motivation for the Word of God? Well, first of all, I put off 
relational sins that hinder God's word's effect on my life. 1 Peter 2.1 Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. In the context, it is clear that these relational sins will hinder your motivation for the word. To put off means to cast aside, like you take off dirty clothes. These sins are baggage from our past, before we were born again. They surround us as we live in this sinful word world. They are standard operating procedure for many people in the world, especially when they get into a tough situation. Let's quickly go over that list. Malice, a general word for wickedness of every kind, but especially having it for someone else. Guile, originally meant bait or snare, but it came to mean deceit. Jesus looked at one of the disciples at a distance and he said, there is no guile in that man. There's no evil in that person. I really wish that I could say that if Jesus ever came down and knocked on my front door, he'd walk in and he'd go, there is no guile here. There is no deceit. There is no lying. There is no evil. There's nothing that happens. There are no mistakes that are ever made. Envying refers to an attitude behind much deceit and hypocrisy. It means being jealous of another person or their things. It was the motive behind the crucifixion of Jesus. The religious leaders were envious of his popularity. Envy often works itself out in all sorts of slandering. This word speaks against someone. Of course, it often goes with deceit. That's another one. I wish I was never envious. I wish every time that I drove by a Christian worship center, I was joyful in my heart. That I was praising God for all those cars that are in that parking lot. But when I drive by, I go, why are they all going there and not over here? I become a little envious. And it's not something I should do. The slanderer says nice things to a person's face, but disparaging things behind his back with the motive of making himself look good in everyone else's eyes. Christian communication stands against all of these worldly ways. We are to speak the truth in love. And you know that? I don't, I don't know about you, but I've had people who've said that. that they're, they come up to me and they say, I, I have something to speak to you in love. And it was almost like as they gave me a hug, I could feel the knife going right into my spine. That's not the way it should be. Christian communication stands against all of these worldly ways. We are to be different. You don't need years of therapy and delving into your past to stop doing these things. It's a matter of obedience. Make a decisive break with your path. Commit yourself to live as a Christian. If you don't, you won't be motivated to drink in God's word. Positively, focus on the kindness of the Lord. Verse 3, indeed, you have tasted that the Lord is good. And there is no doubt that you have. The Lord is kind. For Peter, Christ is the Lord. This is the quote from Psalms 34, 8. 
It shows that Peter believed that Christ was to be God. It must have been Peter's favorite. He quotes from it again. Also, the theme of verse 34 is roughly the same as that of 1 Peter. If in distress you seek the Lord, he will deliver you from all of your troubles. For though the afflictions of the righteous are many, the Lord will rescue them out of trouble. And what do we spend doing during our prayer time? We lift our prayers up to God. So He will rescue us from the perils that we are going through on earth. Peter is referring especially to the Lord's kindness or grace that was shown to us when we trusted Him as Savior and Lord. If you are saved, you have tasted the Lord's kindness because you know that you did not deserve His grace. You deserved His judgment. There is no greater joy that we have than, we are, than when we are joined by a brother or sister through baptism. My son has been doing something on Facebook. It's called the Great Joy Hunt. And I was talking to him a while back on the phone and I said, you know what brings me joy? Andrew is very good about watching us on YouTube. And he said, Dad, was it when that young man got baptized? And I said, yes. I said, to know that that young man is born again, he is part of the family of God, brings me such great joy. I often share with, with people a time when we had a, uh, a youth service right on the beach. And I had to tell one of the other counselors, they said, I got I to gotta take a walk down the beach. So I took a walk down the beach. And I was simply saying, Lord, thank you. Because one of my best friends had come forward. That best friend, later on that night, we were, we were sleeping in someone else's church. And thank God they kept their baptistry full because we were able to baptize Andy that night. I was able to see one of my friends come close to the Lord. Peter is referring especially to the Lord's kindness and grace that was shown to us when we trusted Him as Savior and Lord. God made provision for me, the sinner, so that I would experience His forgiveness and receive eternal life as a free gift. So how do we drink in God's Word? First of all, we read it. I don't know if you need to get yourself one of those read through the Bible in a year. I don't know. I, I had a friend who he, he had it set up. He read, let's see, a section of the Old Testament, a section of the New Testament, five of the Psalms, and one chapter of Proverbs every day. I was pretty impressed with him. Of course, I gave him a hard time because we would be talking about heaven and I said, which heaven are you talking about? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, are you talking about the Baptist heaven? Are you talking about the non-denominational heaven? He goes, Mark, I'm talking about heaven. And he would get me, he'd go, I'm talking about biblical heaven. Because that's all we need to worry about. I mean, I can tease my Catholic friend and I can say, you know, Craig, I'm pretty sure you're going to heaven. But it's going to take you a little while longer to get there. 
And he goes, why? He go, I'm sorry, you have to go through purgatory first. Sometimes you may be thinking, I'm not a reader. I would suggest, I, I don't care how, how little you read. But God chooses us to communicate His Word in written form. We should enjoy the freedom we have. I used to have a lady here named Helen Johnson. Helen and I, Helen and I went together and, and we literally compared the uh, collections of Bibles we had. And she amazed me because she had this little tiny print Bible that she would read. And the woman knew the Bible so well that when I was leading a Bible study on Tuesday morning, I could look across the table and without even opening that Bible, she was able to read along with me. She knew it that well. If you're a new Christian, start in the New Testament. Read it through several times. Read the Psalms and Proverbs. Then tackle the whole Bible. Now, I haven't known a lot of people that have really gotten a whole lot out of the book of Numbers. Because it really just gives a list of numbers of the tribes. But there was one lady, a friend of mine, who used that book as a baby book. She looked through the and, and actually, just like uh, Shelly and Ben, she had eight. When she had number eight, she named him Zethan. C-E-N. Where did you even get this name? Well, she showed us right in the book of Numbers where she had found this name. And we said, why Zephan? And she said, Z, it's the last one. <laughs> and the funniest part was, for Nancy, it wasn't the last one. When the seventh and eighth ones graduated from college, she adopted two more. Why? Why do you need to adopt two more? She said, the house is just getting too quiet. She was used to that level of noise and confusion. It was a blessing for her. Taste it. The image of milk and tasting God's kindness brings up the fact that the word is not just to fill your head with knowledge. There have been people who have memorized all of Scripture just to use it against God. I have heard that Stalin did. I've heard that Hitler knew a great part of Scripture. It didn't do him any good because they didn't let it sink down into their heart. Taste points both to your personal experience and enjoyment. I remember... I can't, I can't taste it for you. I can preach on Sundays, but you're going to have to get into the Word for yourself. You can see and hear and smell something at a distance, but to taste it, it has to touch your tongue. You can only taste God's word by drawing near to God and personally appropriating the riches of knowing him. J.I. Packer, in his quest for godliness, tells of this Puritan preacher named John Rogers, who bore down on his 500 hearers for neglecting the Bible. First, he personated, he personated God to the people telling them, I have trusted you so long with my Bible. It lies in such houses, all covered with dust and cobwebs, 
you care not to listen to it. Do you use my Bible so? Well, you shall have my Bible no longer. And you took the Bible from the pulpit and seemed as if he were going to carry it away with him. But then he spun around and he personated the people to God. He fell on his knees and he pleaded earnestly, Lord, whatever you do to us, take not your Bible from us. Kill our children, burn our houses, destroy our goods. Only spare us your Bible. Don't take away your word. Thus he personated God again to the people. Say you so? Will I try you a while longer? Here is my Bible for you. I will see how you use it. Whether you will love it more observe it more, practice it more, live it more, according to it. At this point, according to Thomas Goodwin, who was there and who later became a powerful preacher in his own right, the entire congregation dissolved into tears. Goodwin himself, when he got outside, hung on the neck of his horse, weeping for a quarter of an hour before he had the strength to mount so powerful an impression as was on him. If you don't have a craving for God's word, there could be several reasons. Maybe you've never tasted the words kindness and salvation. You need to believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he offers his salvation to you as a free gift. Take it and start feeding on the Bible. You may not have a strong craving for God's word because of sin that is in your own life. Someone has said that God's word will keep you from sin and sin will keep you from God's word. Confess and forsake it and get back into the Bible. You have ruined your appetite by feeding on junk food of this world. Hunger makes a good cook, as the saying goes. If you don't sense your, need, your great need for God and his word, it may be because you filled up on junk, like television. Shut it off. Or maybe you've been filling up on the junk food being sold at the Christian bookstore under the label of Christian, which waters down the pure word of God with modern man's wisdom. Such junk food makes you feel full. But it doesn't nourish the soul. Don't waste your time reading it. There are some excellent Christian books that will help you understand and apply God's truth. They're, worth, they're well worth reading. But above all else, read your Bible. Hunger. For God's truth. Drink it in like a nursing infant. You've got to have it above all else. If you want to grow in your salvation. Let's go to the Lord. Father we come to you right now. And Lord I ask that you would once again. Knock on the doors of our hearts. Let us realize that Sundays are for us to rededicate our lives. We rededicate our lives to you. We do that in the time of communion. But Lord, let us also rededicate our lives to a, a good diet. And by that, I mean your word. Let us dedicate ourselves to your holy word.
In Jesus' holy name, amen.